Hello and welcome to Wilderness TV. Today we're on the stunning River Usk in Wales with Lewis Hendry, Wilderness TV's very own Southwest Rivers Pro Guide. He's going to show us how to catch some beautiful wild River Usk brown trout and pass on his expert knowledge so we can have a fun, productive and safe day out fishing on the river. So Lewis, Tell me, if you've not fished a river, a river before, how do you go about finding out, A, who, who's in charge of that particular stretch of river, and, I know, and how do you get permission and, or uh, a permit to fish on it? Okay, well, it's actually funny that you should say that because we're actually on a section of river today that's through a passport system. So the way that works is the general public can ring the Y and Us Foundation, which is the water we're on, and they can either go online and search through, and you can actually book a day session on the river uh, for either individual rods or a, or a group of people but all the instructions are on there so what species you can go fish for, what you can target, how many people can fish there that day um, and what methods you're allowed to fish um, and that's the lovely thing it's, it's good that we're starting to see more and more passports actually come into more regions of the country to allow the members of public, the general public to have somewhere to fish because a lot of people don't have the awareness of the rivers that are available to them as day permit water. A lot of things they think is syndicated or it's too tough to get on these waters but if you look in the right places or talk to the right people there is actually quite a lot of water available and actually for an affordable price. I mean today's tickets about £15 per person and for some of the, uh, the fishing that we'll get today it's worth every penny. And so do people have to have a, a rod license as well as a permit to fish? Oh yes, yeah it's important that we have our rod license so you get that through the environment agency. You can either go into your local post office or you can go online to, to apply for one of them uh, and it's £27.50 I'm pretty sure um, for a concessionary license and that will allow you to come on the rivers and target the trout and the grayling. You have to get a separate one for salmon and sea trout but, uh, but yeah it's basically, it's, it's there, it's available and as long as you've got your fishing license to be out on these rivers then it's, it's for, here for everyone to enjoy conditions are pretty good it's a bit overcast with some sunny spells um, there's a lot of insect life hatching off as well so we might even get a few fish coming up to the dries but we're going to go through relevant techniques that are going to allow us to give us the best shot of catching these fish now something that's really special about the river usk is the quality of the water i mean it's probably one of the, the premier trout fisheries of the uk in terms of rivers just because the river's so healthy there's a lot of insect life and the fish reach in pretty big sizes um, I mean there's a very good chance today that we might even pull off a few fish, maybe a couple of pound. It's just a case that we've got to fish the water productively and we'll look at all the best places. So I'll give you a few tips here and there. And, uh... and are these, Lewis, are these fish, so explain to people who perhaps haven't done river fishing before, are these fish wild? Is they're this wild fish. Stopped? They're wild no, fish. No, they're so wild it's not fish. Stopped. No. And are we brown trout or, brown or trout. rainbow so it, trout? No, well rainbows, there's only a couple of rivers in the UK that have got uh, a productive uh, spawning population of rainbow trout so most of our fishing is for brown trout and this is a, a brown trout fishery um, but as I said the fish gets to some pretty good sizes so you've got to treat every time you hook, hook a fish you've got to be ready that that could be a good fish because yeah, there's a good nice chance you could get bust off or, yeah, okay. or so on so we've just got to respect that there are bigger fish in here um, we're just going to fish it hard we may pull fish of all kinds of different sizes but we'll just go and fish the light looking water and see what we can pull Right, well the water that we've got in front of us today is we have a series of, of different environments. We've got pocket water, we've got riffles and runs and some fairly flat water. Now that's going to allow us to fish a number of different techniques to suit the job and we'll apply the right method to the type of water that we're fishing. So when we fish the deeper or the faster water we're probably want to get, going to want to get our flies down under that current, down into the column where the fish are feeding, the water column where the fish are feeding. So we'll be looking for little gullies, channels, back eddies, so where the water's swirling back on itself. Anything like that where it looks like it's going to hold a fish. So I'll talk to you a bit about watercraft and we'll make sure that we hit the right techniques for the right time and see what happens really. We want you to stay safe whilst wading. So here are our top tips for wading safety. A wading belt should be a mandatory part of your kit when using waders. 
A wading belt can slow the flow of water into your legs and boots of your waders if you fall over, and it can make getting out the river far easier. A wading belt can also help you keep your legs and feet dry, meaning you can continue your day's fishing comfortably and not have to head home early. Consider using strap-on soles. While some anglers opt for felt soles, you'll be a far lot safer with strap-ons, cleats and studs while wading in the water. There are also environmental contamination reasons why felt soles might not be a good idea. A wading staff is a great way to help you maintain stability and keep yourself safe in difficult wading conditions. It allows you to maintain two points of contact on the ground whilst wading. The wading staff may make all the difference between staying dry and falling over. Move slowly. Don't rush into the water. Take your time to evaluate the conditions. While it may seem rather obvious to keep slow when wading, it's probably far more important than it first seems. Maintain a wide stance by keeping your feet shoulder width apart. Try and keep your knees flexed and stand as firm as possible. The main reason that people fall while wading is that their feet slip out from under them. The wide stance cuts down on this and allows you to keep your balance centered. Be smart. Try to keep all your movements either forwards or sideways as this will allow you to hold your balance much, much better. Sometimes it can be tempting to get on top of boulders to fish, but the difficulty comes when trying to descend. Make sure that you map out your route back down before you go up. Plan your escape. Before you even start fishing, you should plan your exit strategy. Make sure you know your options on how you're going to exit the water and ask yourself, what happens if I fall over? The big question should be, should I be wading here? You can take a number of additional precautions when wading. Perhaps think about flotation devices, especially if you're not a confident swimmer. Now our last tip is how about fishing with a friend? Now it's great to get out fishing on your own, but fishing with a friend can have its own rewards. You can help each other stay safe and you can share the moment. If you are fishing alone, however, always let someone know where you are fishing and when you're likely to be back. Wading is great fun and can be an effective way to some ideal trout fishing locations. Just recognize the dangers and take the necessary precautions. Now, I think we've probably let Ben ever go. I think we should. Because that's two nil, isn't it, so far? <laughs> Watercraft's essential because it allows us to pinpoint where those fish are going to be. So we're looking for lightly looking water. So anywhere where there's that shelter, so where the fish can hold behind a boulder or a bit of a snag. So it's not having to battle against the full force of the current all day. So, because imagine if it was in that fast water all day, it's going to get pretty tired. So we're looking for the fish to be sat just slightly off the fast water, what I would call the crease. So between the diversion of the fast and the slow water, and those fish are going to be sat there and we're going to put our flies right down the middle of that set intersection and hope that there's going to be a fish there. As long as we've got that, that deep gullies, we've got a bit of tree cover or anything like that that just looks fishy where the fish are going to have plenty of oxygen, they're going to feel safe. The abundance of food available to those trout is pretty high so there's going to be terrestrial insects, there's the odd daddy long legs I've seen flying about, there's going to be beetles, little bugs, crickets, things like that, that may float, may get, get blown onto the water and end up floating down the stream and fish, fish eating them. But there's also going to be a huge population of aquatic insect life right now. So mayfly are hatching out. We've got things like large brook dun, olives and things like that. So olives is a big part of the fish's uh, diet and caddis as well. So understanding that there's an array of insect life in this water allows us to apply the right flies for the right day. And the other thing that you've got to remember is there is such a variety of different insect life under this water that the most important thing is actually to get your flies down to the depth of where they're feeding. And you present those flies in the right place at the right time at those fish and you're going to find you'll be successful. So fly choice isn't always the most crucial thing because there is such a variety.
Well, here we are on the River Rusk, and another personal best for me. Now, I've knocked into a good two pound, if not a little bit more, wild brown trout. It's an absolute beauty. Now, uh, it's gonna try and hold it. It's been a bit of a wriggler. It's got loads of energy. It's really fat belly. Looks like it's been eating, and it's got out. I've just caught two, possibly two and a half pound brown trout, a proper river monster, my personal best, and ever guess what? It was bigger than Lewis's, so he decided to put a hole in my net. Look, look at this, look at that hole. Bang, and the fish was gone. He better put me on some more fish, otherwise there's gonna be trouble. Stunning fish. Lewis, what's happened? I caught a tree. And at the end of the day, a lot of people think, a lot of beginners or progressing anglers always think, oh, I'm the only one that catches trees. They give themselves a real hard time. But in actual fact, we all do it. I've been fishing on rivers for years, but I still forget about those trees and I still get caught in them. So it's not something to get worried about. It's gonna happen. Now, although this isn't a bit of kind of constructive advice, at the end of the day, we do catch trees, as you can see here. What I'm going to do is the right way to actually get my fly back out the tree. I've seen a lot of people, they'll use their rod and try and yank it back. But that ends up and results in a broken rod. So the best thing to do is pop the rod down somewhere safe. It's nice and slow water here. My rod's not going to drift off downstream. Grab hold of your line. Make sure your hands are away from any of the hooks. And just try and grab a tree branch. Pull the tree down. Pop the fly off. And I mean, although it's a bit of a pain, it's allowed me to get my flies back pretty quickly and I've not done any harm to the rod. And uh, my, sit, my, my rig here is still absolutely fine to go and fish again. So I've not damaged the lead or anything. I've not put too much pressure on it. So uh, let's go see what we can catch.
The idea, when you're casting directly up above you, by tracking back, you're generally raising the rod tip as you come back, so you're lifting the rod higher and higher and higher. And then when you get to the point where you reach about 10 o'clock in front of you, then go into a, a false cast out behind you, so an overhead cast, flip the line off the water, and that'll give you your momentum and your acceleration to load the rod and the forward cast. Yeah. Um, and then when you're coming down the side like you are there, you can track back with it. So the benefits to fishing from the side, it is so much easier because you're just tracking back around the side and you can follow the flies right downstream and get what we call a full drift. So you can actually make your flies swing behind you. Yeah. And then you might take your fish from behind you. But I associate that more with grayling. But in terms of when you're casting upstream, and because we're fishing for brownies, most of our uh, interest is what's in front of us, okay? So we want to cover new fish, virgin fish that, that haven't seen our fly yet, that haven't spooked, that have got complete confidence when they come along to take our fly. I'll just make sure I keep them out the hole. Where's he gone? Yeah, there he is. Yeah. Wow. I don't like when they jump, they can get, uh, that's when the hook can spit. Put up a scrap, isn't he? How much resistance can you put on them? Raining, and all of a sudden the fish have come on the feed and I've caught this absolutely cracking fish absolute beauty we'll uh, just get him back in there and let him get away and there he goes what an absolute beautiful fish cracking fish mate well done we had an absolutely awesome day fishing for wild brown trout on the river rusk it produced some exceptional fish in a stunning location for more information on fishing with us, why not visit the Why and Us Foundation's website at www.whyusfoundation.org. We look forward to seeing you again soon at wildernesstv.com. Tight lines and bye for now.